Well, I'm excited to preach this sermon from our sanctuary. It's empty, but I'm here. <laughs> Started in my living room, moved to our outreach quarters, and now we're back in to my spiritual home where I love to be as the next phase to, uh, to getting things <laughs> as closely back to normal as possible. But it just feels good being in God's house again. Those who know our ministry, worldview, and philosophy know it as the kingdom agenda, the visible demonstration and manifestation of the comprehensive rule of God over every area of life. In all that we are facing today, there is a clarion call from heaven to history, from eternity into time. And that is a call for Christians to become kingdom disciples. Not just churchgoers, not just religious people who carry their Bibles, but kingdom disciples. These are not part-time Christians, these are full-time saints who apply all of life to the rule of God as they pursue an intimate relationship with him. I often use the illustration of a football field where there are competing teams who bring different worldviews, different playbooks to the game and who spend time in conflict with one another. We're seeing that all around us today. We're seeing the teams line up. We're seeing the Republican team and the Democratic team clash. The white team and the black team clash. The police team and the community team clash. We're seeing the poor team and the rich team clash. And we're seeing the conflict not ending just like in a football game where the clash keeps on going for the extent of the game. Everybody trying to win. But in the midst of a clash of a football game is a third team. That's the team of officials. This officiating crew does not belong to either team that's in conflict on the field. They belong to the NFL, they belong to another order. They represent the NFL in New York on the conflict where they have been placed to represent on the field of play. They don't don the uniforms of either team because they have their own black and white identity in the jerseys that they wear. They are distinct. Each has been handed a book and that book governs all decisions made on the field of play. Their personal opinions must be subject to that book. Their preferences must be subject to that book. They know sometimes they're going to be booed. They know sometimes they're going to be cheered, but popularity is not their first concern. It's obedience to the book in the middle of the conflict that matters. You will often see this team of officials gathered in a circle so that there is a unified call regarding the play because they understand that they are to be one in the call no matter which team they're calling for because they represent the kingdom in New York and the chaos on the field of play. Unfortunately today, God has an officiating crew that's joined the teams. They're more Democrat than Christian or more Republican than Christian, more black than Christian than, or more white than Christian, more part of siding with this group versus that group than Christian. And instead of bringing order to the field of play, they are adding to the chaos on the field of play. That is because Far too many Christians, far too many Christian leaders, far too many churches don't understand that we belong to another kingdom run by another king who has his own playbook. And until there's the decision to operate on earth by the playbook that comes 
from the kingdom in heaven by the executive who rules that kingdom. Rather than bringing order to the chaos, we will find ourselves part of the chaos and even contributing to the chaos. Jesus called a meeting of his officiating crew in Matthew 28. Three groups attend the meeting. It says in verse 16, the 11 disciples, that is minus Judas, attended the meeting. 1 Corinthians 15 says more, more than 500 brethren attended the meeting. And then it says that Jesus concluded the meeting by saying that he's going to be with us till the end of the age. Well, we haven't come to the end of the age yet. So guess what? You and I have been invited to the meeting. So the 16, the 500, and everybody else. Jesus Christ has been invited to the meeting. So why don't we mosey on up to the hill that was designated? That is the mountain in Galilee where Jesus called the meeting to find out what this meeting is about and find out what this call is about where Jesus is looking for some kingdom disciples, not cultural Christians, not even first American Christians, kingdom Christians who are in the culture, who are part of the nation, but who are not defined by it. It says, when they saw him, verse 17, they worshiped. They sang their songs, they prayed their prayers, 
they celebrated the resurrected Christ. Because worship is always where you start. Worship is the recognition of God for who he is, what he has done, and what you are trusting him to do. It is giving God his kudos. It is giving God the praise that his name deserves. And they did it through the worship of Jesus Christ because Jesus Christ is our point of access to the Father in heaven. You skip him, you miss the Father. That's why Jesus could tell Philip, when you've seen me, you've seen the Father. <laughs> You're looking for the Father. Well, you better come through me because I give you the greatest clarity of who the Father is, how the Father functions, and what the Father wants. So they have their worship service, but we're told that some were doubtful. They were, they were there, but they had question marks. I know when we look at all the challenges medically and culturally and racially and socially, and some are doubting. They're doubting whether Christianity works, whether Jesus is as powerful as he declares himself to be. Does God care about injustice or righteousness or chaos and confusion? Some were doubting. But even though they were doubtful, they were still there. They didn't let their doubts keep them home. They let their doubts bring them out. So even if you have some questions when you see the chaos in the world, are, are they going to drive you to retreat or are they going to drive you to draw near? They at least let their questions bring them near and they worshiped. When they worshiped or after they worshiped, it was time for the sermon. Jesus Christ steps up to the podium because he's the pulpiteer for the day. Jesus Christ lets out a blow your mind kind of statement. Says all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. No, you didn't. All authority is given to me in heaven and on earth. Translation, I'm in charge up there and I'm in charge down here. I'm in charge in the sweet by and by, but I'm also running things in the nasty here and now. I'm in charge in forever and I'm in charge now. I run both shows. The Greek word authority is the Greek word ekousia. The number of the Greek words for power or authority in the New Testament, the one noted most is dunamis. That's like where we get our English word dynamite from. It's, it's explosive power, but that's not the word he uses here. The word ekousia has to do with authority in legitimate hands. It has to do with the legitimate right to exercise power. Let's go back to football. The players are younger, stronger, and faster than the officiating crew. They've been lifting weights, they've been running, they've been training, they've been working out. So they've got dunamis. But the officiating crew has ekousia because they got a whistle and a yellow flag. They're outnumbered on the field of play. You got 11 on offense, 11 on defense, who are younger, stronger, and faster. The officiating crew is older, slower, and fatter. So, so, so they're outmanned when it comes to power, but not when it comes to authority because they can blow the whistle and stop the show. They can throw the flag and penalize you because even though you outnumber them and you got more dunamis, you don't have more ekousia because they got the badge of authority. Guess what Jesus says? I'm in charge now. Not only up there, heaven and earth. I'm in charge down here. I'm running the show. What Jesus is claiming is that he has been designated by the Father to operate on his behalf in history. He wants to call the shots for history. He wants to call the shot not only for your life, he wants to call the shots for your family. He wants to call the shots for your business. He wants to call the shots for your church. He wants to call the shots for your politicians. He wants to call the shots for your leaders. He says, I'm in charge now. Now, you know, somebody can have duly authority and you still rebel against them. In other words, you don't accept their authority 
even they though even though they possess legitimate authority what we have found too far today is people have rejected Jesus's legitimate authority and they're going to their own teams exchanging jerseys and then not paying attention to what the duly authorized authority has to say we would nearly have this mess at this level if Jesus was allowed to be in charge. And I'm not talking about some ethereal in charge that's out there in Never Never Land. Because remember, he said heaven and earth, eternity and time. But then he comes and he explains why this matters. If we're going to fix this madness, solve this mess on both the issues of injustice and the pain and the history and the circumstances that keep it going generationally or the issue of righteousness the right response based on God's word if we're gonna put these twin towers together since from God's throne again Psalm 89 14 comes righteousness and justice these are not seesaws to go up and down these are twins who are joined at the hip you don't skip injustice and call for righteousness and you don't skip righteousness in the name of injustice no you got to go for both because jesus says i'm running the show now so i should call the shots based on my book he says i ah, here's what i want you to do i want you to make disciples now this passage gets watered down because it gets watered down to mean make, make Christians. Now don't, don't, don't get me wrong. <laughs> you need to become a Christian if you're going to be a disciple. But he's talking about more than getting a passport to heaven. Trusting Jesus Christ as your personal sin bearer forgives you of your sins and gives you the free gift of eternal life for heaven. But his authority is not just in heaven, it's on earth. He says, I need some folk who will follow me in history. That's what discipleship is all about. Discipleship is a term for history. Conversion is your term for eternity, but discipleship is how you, how you are living it out in time and space. What is a disciple? He or she is a visible, verbal follower of Jesus Christ. A disciple is a person who is progressively learning to live all of life under the authority, the rulership of Jesus Christ. It comes from a, a Greek concept when Plato's influence hit Aristotle and Aristotle set up academies, schools to train people in platonic thought set through Aristotelian logic so that this generation of thinkers would invade the culture with the thinking of Plato through the system of Aristotle in order to transfer, transform the culture. We call it in history the Hellenization of Rome. That is when Rome was the military power, but it was under Greek influence because they had been culturized in their thinking and in their operation by the influence of this training. Jesus says, I'm the trainer. You're the trainee. And I want to train you with my authority in kingdom thinking, kingdom living, and kingdom operating. A kingdom disciple is a person who reflects the values of heaven in the decisions that have to be made on earth. They're not just dipping in and out of the Christian faith. They're not taking parts of the Bible that work for them and ignoring the parts of the Bible that they don't like. No, because they're under full-time authority. Many of our problems today that we're dealing with is because God has not had enough of his officiating crew on the field representing him because they've joined the teams. They're more Democrat than Christian, Republican, than Christian, as I said, and you can pick the category, but they're not wearing the unique uniform of the kingdom. 
because they're not disciples. They may be Christians on their way to heaven, but they're no good for the field on earth, except the pieces that they like and are convenient. No, he says, I want you to make disciples. That's an imperative in the Greek text. In other words, he's not requesting it, he's demanding it. Our problem is we have too many church members who aren't willing to be disciples. They aren't willing to subject their humanity to Christ's authority. And so they run back to their teams in order to get team acceptance rather than kingdom acceptance, leading to all kinds of unresolvable chaos because the officiating crew won't officiate based on the data that they're getting from heaven for how things are to operate in history. Why is Jesus saying, I want you to make disciples? He's saying, I want you to make disciples because he only transfers his authority. Because remember, all authority belongs to him. He only transfers ecclesia to disciples. He doesn't transfer it just because you're human, nor does he transfer it just because you're saved, you're a Christian. He transfers it because he can trust you with it. Because he knows you're not going to change books on it. See, we have Christians who change books. <laughs> they go to cultural documents, racial documents, historical documents that contradict his document. You can go to those documents, but they must be evaluated based on his final authority. He says, make disciples. People who take my word and my rule and relationship with me seriously, meaning it determines your decisions regardless of how you feel. He gets to overrule you because he's in the position of authority. Notice what he says, I want you to disciple. Because you don't often hear this when this passage is preached. He says, I want you to disciple the nations. Most of the time when we talk about discipleship, we talk about discipling individuals. And certainly we want to disciple people but God's kingdom is bigger than just your individual life. It involves your personal discipleship, your family discipleship, your church discipleship, and your civil discipleship. That's why he can speak nationally. That's why we should be addressing not only personal sins, family sins, church sins, but national sins. He says, I want the structures that make up nations addressed as well as the structures that make up your life and your home. If you came to me and your life was out of order, I would try to take this book, give you God's standard, give you practical ways to address your need so that his authority would flow to the resolution of your personal dilemma. If you brought your family to me and said,
my family is falling apart. I take the same book, give you God's standards for what a man is and how a man is to function, what a woman is, how she is to function, what parents and children are, how they are to function, give you practical ways to implement it and expect his authority to bring order to your house. If your church came to me and said our church is in chaos, I take the same book, I give you his standards for what the roles are, how the roles are supposed to function, practical steps to implement it so God's spirit could give you and transfer his authority to bringing the church and making it whole again. But what if you brought your Congress to me or your president to me or your commissioners to me or your mayors to me? Well, guess what I wouldn't do? I wouldn't change books. I wouldn't switch books because the Bible says God created government. Civil leaders aren't on their own. They don't get to, to choose how they run a government. God, ex God has established how a government's supposed to run. He calls the government leaders ministers of God, not just ministers of culture. And he says, I want to instruct you how to do it. So, so when a culture is in trouble, you don't switch books. And we have too many leaders switching books. And it's not just having the book or holding the book it is utilizing the book for decision making. And until you do that, you're not taking seriously being a disciple, which means you can have all the prayer meetings you want and you won't hear from heaven. You can, you can have all the prayer meetings you want and God's not going to move because he will not define your decision. And when he knows he can't define your decision, he's not going to share his ecousia, his authority with you. But for those who are willing to become disciples in their individual family, church, and cultural lives, ah, and now you can draw heaven down into history because you're not just a Christian, you are a disciple. If you're not a Christian, you need to come to Christ. If you are a Christian, you need to be ruled by Christ as you grow in intimacy with him by learning what that rule looks like. He shares his authority. I tell when... I was chaplain of the Cowboys and chaplain of the Mavericks. I get tickets to the game and I'd invite people to go with me, but I say, stay close to me because there are certain rights and privileges that come if you stick with me that you don't get if you wander off on your own. I have a, I have a parking pass. So if you ride in my car, you get to park where I park because you're hanging out with me. You drive your own car, you pay your own price. I get to go through a private door. You come with me, you get to go through that door. But that's not because of who you are, that's because of who I am. You're close to me. You get to sit in certain seats. That's because they're my tickets that I'm on loan to you. So you get to sit with me. But that's not because of who you are, that's because of who you're with. When it's over, we're not trying to rush like everybody else. We go on a private exit, up a private elevator, out a private door to a private parking lot, and you'll be home before most people have gotten out of the lot, and that is because of who you are with. Jesus says, if you want to see my authority in heaven, you better come and hang out with me. And that doesn't mean Christianese, isn't God good all the time, all the time God is good. That's nice, but that's not enough. It means I'm submitting to biblical authority on all four of those categories of the kingdom. And everything has to adjust to that. Even if it's against how I was raised, even if it's against what my mom and daddy taught me, even if it agree, agree, disagrees with my politics or my race or my class or my culture, it doesn't deny any of those. But black is most beautiful when it's biblical and white is only right when it submits to God's rule. When those standards are adhered to, then you can celebrate who you are because who you are is being defined by who he is. He says there are three things you've got to do if you're serious about becoming a disciple. He lists three participles in the Greek construct. The participles explain and define the imperative. The imperative is make disciples. He says go, baptize, and teach. Those are the three participles. Go. Now you can study go in Hebrew, Greek, <laughs> Ugaritic, <laughs> Syriac. <laughs> you, can, you can study it. And go means go. <laughs> it means don't stay. It means publicly represent me. Oh, it's safe when we're in church. No competition there. There's only one team on the field. 
when you leave church, you have to go out there. Are you visibly representing me? Or are you just talking a good game? And that has to show up in your decisions. Your walk, not your talk. Your life, not your lip. Your movement, not your mouth. He says go. That means public display. You know, when we gather in our worship services, it's like a huddle in a football game. The other team is not allowed in the huddle. And 65,000 people, 100,000 people don't show up to watch their team huddle. They don't mind a huddle as long as you only spend a few seconds in it. What they want to see is what difference will the huddle make? Having huddled, will you now score? What are you going to do about 11 other men on the other side of the ball daring you to go public with your private conversation? See, they want to see what happens when you break huddle. We got a lot of churches. We've got a lot of leaders. We haven't broken huddle enough. We've talked about love, but we haven't broken huddle with it. We talked about justice, but we haven't broken huddle with it. We talk about righteousness, but we haven't broken huddle with it. We, we talk to each other in the huddle. We don't go and let the public see what kingdom disciples look like in unison because we have one Lord, one kingdom, one authority, one book. Second thing he says, is I want you to baptize them. Now, he doesn't mean just get them wet. Baptizo was used of a, the Greek word is baptizo. It was used of a dye maker in New Testament days where a mother would bring some cloth because she was going to sew a dress for her daughter and the dye maker would baptize it, that is immerse it in a color so that if she wanted to make a pink dress, blue dress, red dress, the cloth would now reflect the color of the baptism, the baptizo in the dye. Well, if you have come to Jesus Christ and you have been baptized, you have a color. It's red because you're to be defined by the blood. When a football team comes on the field, you don't see different uniforms. You see one uniform that doesn't divide, deny the person in the uniform. If he's black, he's still black. White, still white. Hispanic, is still Hispanic. Doesn't deny their humanity, but their humanity is covered by a centrally defined uniform. Our commitment to Christ must be defined by the blood. It must be defined by our unified commitment to him. He is our identity. That's what it means to be baptized. It has to do with your classification. And you must be Christian first. Let me say that again. You must be Christian first. If you're not Christian first, then you have insulted Christ. Yes, keep your humanity. God is not calling all of us to be the same. He's, all, he's calling us to wear the same uniform, though, without losing the uniqueness that he's given each of us in the spheres of our influence. It is time for the church of Jesus Christ to wear the same uniform publicly, not just privately, in church where there, the other team's not there. That you are to be defined by your faith, not by your feelings. If mother was wrong, mother was wrong. If daddy was wrong, daddy was wrong. If my race is wrong, my race is wrong. If the community is wrong, community is wrong. The politicians are wrong, politicians are wrong. The police are wrong, the police are wrong. Why? Because I'm wearing one uniform here and it's defined in my decision-making by Jesus Christ. And I'm calling it like he calls it on every level of life. He says, no, you, you're to be baptized. You're to put on this, this uniform. And then he says, teach them. Teach them to observe whatever I command you. Oh, yeah, teach them doctrine. Teach them pneumatology, ecclesiology, eschatology, angelology, anthropology. Teach them all the ologies. 
but the whole point of theologies is to observe. In other words, teach them how to live it, not just learn it. You know, we got we get a lot of amens. Praise the Lord, hallelujah. You, you know, we get a lot of learning, but Jesus doesn't just give authority to learners. He gives authority to observers. That is, people who are ready to implement his truth, not just discuss it. See, because we, pontifications are everywhere. Everybody has a thought, everybody has an idea. Well, let me explain something. There are two answers to every question. God's answer and everybody else's. And everybody else is wrong when they disagree with him. God has spoken and he has not stuttered. He's spoken about racism. He's spoken about injustice. He's spoken about classism. He's spoken about culturalism. He's spoken about politics. He's spoken about freedom. He's spoken about all the sy systemic Ill, uh, uh, injustices as well as injustices that come from our personal hearts. God has spoken about all these subjects, but what we do, unfortunately, is pick and choose. And we don't deal with the whole counsel of God. He says, no, you teach him to observe it. And not only in church, but in the workplace, in the political spheres. That's what you do. And we don't have enough disciples who observe all that he's commanded, not just the parts that they like. That's what it says. He closes with a, a statement. He says, and I will be with you always, even until the end of the age. Ah, oh. now in the Greek text, we call this the ego I me construction. The word I is written twice. If you were to read it literally, it would say I, even I will be with you. But they didn't write the word I twice. They just intensified the word I and lo I. That means show enough me. <laughs> I will hang out with you if you are this. Not if you're a Christian, if you're a disciple, a person growing in relationship with, to me who is simultaneously submitted to my rule in every category and who do it publicly, not just privately. Let me put it another way. Jesus does not relate to all Christians equally. Doesn't matter your color, your culture, you know, uh, in St. John chapter 2, verses 23 to 25, you read a statement. It says, many believed in him. Many became Christians. The Greek phrase, pistuois, always means to become a Christian. Many believed in him, got saved, got converted. But then it goes on to say, but he would not commit himself to them because he knew what was in them. Whoa, they got saved but he wouldn't entrust himself. He wouldn't commit himself. Why? Because they weren't committed yet. They were on their way to heaven, but he couldn't use them on earth. They had believed in him for eternal life, but he wasn't ready to impart his authority to them because they weren't all in yet. The reason why we're not seeing prayers answered, the reason why we're not seeing calm in the middle of our storms, socially, politically, economically, racially, and even medically, with this crisis is because he doesn't have enough full-time commitment. We have the ability to change God's mind and God's mind, trust me, is the one we need to change. But we will not change his mind until we change the comprehensive nature of our commitment. We have watered down Christianity to be heavenly and not historically implemented says, I will be with you always, even until the end of the day. I'm going to hang out with that kind of Christian, that kind of church, that kind of pastor, that kind of family who live it out publicly in all areas of life. So there's a call, a clarion call. It's a call for kingdom disciples. Men and women pursuing an intimate relationship with Jesus Christ while submitting to his authority even when they don't prefer what the rule book says. When he sees that, and the broader he sees that, especially coming out of our churches, then he, he's comfortable sharing his ecclesia because he knows we're producing disciples, not just church members. We're producing people who are all in, not just there for the program. This is a serious meeting Jesus called. 
because this is serious authority he came to offer. In closing, a, a man one day was on his way to his honeymoon. New bride was in his car. They were on their way to spend their first night together. But to get to the place where they were going, they had to go down a, a lonely country road on a heavenly foggy night. There was a big truck in front of the car and he wanted to pass the truck. When he pulled out to pass the truck, he didn't see the oncoming van and there was a head-on collision. The van knocked his car up in the air and flipped it over into a ditch. Both he and his new bride were knocked unconscious. He came to first, looked over into the passenger side and saw his, his bride gushing with blood. He knew that she would bleed out and die soon if there was not help given immediately. As fortune would have it, he looked out of the windshield and saw a sign that said, Office of Dr. Bill Jones. How fortunate could it be that this accident happened in front of a doctor's office? He went over and got his beloved and picked her up and stumbled up to the house, knocked on the door. An old gentleman came to the door. He said, what can I do for you? He says, she's dying, she's dying. Please save her. The doctor said, I am so sorry. I don't practice medicine anymore. That's when the young man angrily looked at him and said, Mr. You have two choices. Either save her or take down your sign. But don't have a sign stuck up there suggesting that there's help here because it said office of Dr. Bill Jones. But when we show up, you don't practice anymore. It's time for Christians to do one or two things. It's time for us to practice publicly full-time commitment to the Lordship of Jesus Christ or take down your sign. But don't give the impression you all in. But when a nation is bleeding right in front of our eyes, when hearts are broken, when injustice on one hand and, and irresponsibility on another hand, when failure on one hand and maybe not legitimate response on the other hand, when, when leaders can't fix it, it's time for us to either do what the sign says, full-time commitment under divine authority, or just take down the sign and don't do false advertising. There's a call now for kingdom disciples. There's no issue we face now to which the Lord of heaven and earth doesn't have an answer to those who are willing to do it when he reveals it. There's a call for kingdom disciples. Disciples. Disciples, disciples, disciples. Like a person on an IV, drip, 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 he's doing something. Dr. Tony Evans says the thorns God sends our way make us uncomfortable, but they also make us grow. But if you keep pulling out the IV because you don't like the thorn, you'll never see the medication at work. Celebrating 40 years of faithfulness, this is The Alternative with Dr. Tony Evans, author, speaker, senior pastor of Oak Cliff Bible Fellowship in Dallas, Texas, and president of The Urban Alternative. Even if your life is coming up roses, you'll get your share of thorns to go along with them. But today, Dr. Evans explains that you get them for a reason and talks about specific ways we can deal with their discomfort. Let's join him as he begins today's message in 2 Corinthians chapter 12. In verse 7, he introduces us to it, the reality of a thorn. He says, because of the surpassing greatness of the revelations for this reason, to keep me from exalting myself, there was given to me a thorn in the flesh, a messenger of Satan to buffet me. That's not buffet me. <laughs> to trouble me, to torment me to get on my last nerve. The Greek word for thorn referred to a splinter or a needle of some kind that pricked 
you. We've all had a needle or a thorn or a splinter from wood to get in our finger or toe and irritate us. It could be used of a hook that catches a fish, piercing its, its skin of which it can't shake itself from without tearing and making things worse. A thorn is anything that nags or irritates your life on a continuous basis. A thorn is anything that nags, irritates, exacerbates, or frustrates your life ongoingly. You can't shake it. It hangs around. Paul says, there was given to me a thorn in the flesh. Something to irritate me. Now, you can read commentaries galore and you'll have a lot of guesswork as to what Paul's thorn was. For example, Paul talks about how when he was trying to write the churches, he had trouble seeing. In fact, he had an emanuensis, a, a recorder who would write for him and so some will say, well, it was his eye problem. But still others will say, well, he was always being followed by this group called the Judaizers who were undermining his ministry. And so they were an irritation to him. Maybe it was that. God will do whatever it takes to rid us of our self-sufficiency. I've got a thorn. It hurts won't go away, had it forever, don't see any new revelation. How do I work with this thing? What's my response to the thorn? To get the thorn to do what the thorn is designed to do, what do I do? Well, let's go back to verse 8. He says, concerning this, this thorn, I entreated the Lord three times that it might depart from me. So the first thing he did was pray about the thorn. If you have a thorn, it's getting on your nerves, nagging and irritating you, you pray about it. Paul was praying about it, and God said, no. So how do you make it in the meantime? Here's the verse, verse 9. And God said to me, the one who gave him the thorn said to me, my grace is sufficient for you. For power is perfected in weakness. One of the great verses of the Bible, let me translate that for you. God didn't grant his request, but God met his need. Moses prayed up on the mountain. He said, Lord, Lord let me see your face. God said, no. No, no man can see my face and live. So any Christian who tells you, just pray and God's going to answer because you pray, yeah, he's going to answer it, and it might be no. God is not yes all the time. Or it might be no, not yet. Or not today. Or like we tell our children, wait. But while you wait with this needle jabbing you, you're going to learn a lesson about the greatest word in the Christian vocabulary, grace. There is no greater word than this one. Grace. Grace is God giving you what you can't give yourself. It is God's goodness overrunning you. I am not, or either I am not right now, going to answer your request about getting rid of the thorn. I'm not going to kill your husband. I'm not going to get you that job, give you that promotion, get you out of debt, give you that mate. No. But it hurts. It's sticking me, irritating.
irritating me, nagging me, frustrating me. Okay, I'm not going to give you what you request, but I'm going to give you what you need. You need grace. You need me to come alongside of you and to give you, watch this now, a second wind. You know what a second wind is when you're running. You're running and you're just too tired. You just, you just, you just can't go any further and, and the transmission changes gears. And all of a sudden you get strength you didn't have, energy you didn't have, and it was by grace which meant it had to be given. Because grace is a gift, the Bible says. So grace is given. How much grace? He tells you in verse 9, sufficient grace. God doesn't just give grace. He gives sufficient grace. When does God give sufficient grace? When you pray. He says, I prayed and I got an answer. And the answer wasn't what I asked for, but the answer was what I needed sufficient to what I was going through. Now let me tell you something. There is no thorn you're enduring that God says, no, I'm not going to get rid of, for which there is not sufficient grace to handle until your change comes. That cannot happen. Now, I'm not talking about thorns you sticking yourself with. I'm talking about thorns given to you. But we so much want a yes answer that we miss grace. Let me show you the greatest verse on grace in the Bible. The greatest verse on grace in the Bible. The same book. Turn back a few pages. I'm going to come back. Hold your finger there. But chapter 9 of 2 Corinthians, verse 8. Here it is. Memorize this one. Write it down. Put it in your Bible. Think about it all day. This will get you through anything. Verse 8 of chapter 9. And God is able to make all grace abound to you that always having all sufficiency in everything, you have an abundance for every good deed. Now, he left no stone uncovered in that verse. He says God has got so much grace that it abounds, it, it heats up, and it happens always in all sufficiency. And it doesn't matter about the situation in everything so that not only do you get enough grace, you get bonus grace. And abundance for every good deed. Listen, when you're trying to deal with a thorn and God hasn't taken away a thorn, don't go trying to pull it out yourself. You're going to rip something. You go searching for grace. And where did he get grace? When he prayed three times. The difference between the defeated Christian and the victorious Christian, when they both have the same thorn, is that one is experiencing grace and the other is not. That's the difference. One is being showered with grace and the other is not. Because the other is so irritated at the thorn, they spend all their time dealing with the thorn so they never get around to the new revelation. See, there are two ways to deal with a problem. Let me, let me explain one way is to get rid of it, which is all whether we all want to get rid of the problem. Or another way is to have something so superior happen that you forget it. Let's say you have a thorn of depression or discouragement or not married to the best person in the world or whatever it is. And you go home today or tomorrow from work. You open up your mail and somebody gives you a check for a million dollars. You be running through the house talking about talking, telling that husband that you haven't loved for 15 years. I love you. I love you. I ain't told you that forever, but I love you today. Headache? What a headache? I don't have a headache. What's a headache? Because something new happened. Something unexpected happened. 
that was so awesome, so great, so devastatingly glorious that it made the thorn that hasn't disappeared become insignificant. Some of you have spent your life running from your thorn and you have missed your revelation. You missed your illumination. You've missed the new thing God wants to show you and the humbling he wants to give you by making you dependent on him. Grace. Dr. Evans will come back with one famous person's example of facing up to one of life's thorns when he continues this lesson from his series, Freedom Through Forgiveness. It starts by helping you understand the pardon you receive from God and shows you how to pass on that kind of forgiveness to people who've hurt you, and even how to forgive yourself. And right now, we'd like to send you a copy of Freedom Through Forgiveness as our gift when you make a donation to help support the work of The Urban Alternative here on the air and around the world. This special offer is only available for a limited time, but if we hear from you right away, we'll include a special bonus. Tony's companion booklet for this series, 30 Days to Victory Through Forgiveness which explains why the person who benefits most from your forgiving heart is you. Visit us today at TonyEvans.org for details or call our Resource Center at 1-800-800-3222. That's 1-800-800-3222. Tony will come back with more of today's lesson after this. Even though we'd love for life to be pleasant and happy all the time, that's just not how life works. We will have difficult seasons of life, winter seasons, As Crystal Hurst and Priscilla Shire explore in the new Lois Evans Legacy Bible Study, Seasons of a Woman's Life. The winter season is also an opportunity for you to be driven into the safe place Mm -hmm. and for you to find that you can, even in that difficult season, take refuge in Him. Get your copy of this powerful book, workbook, and DVD series now with your generous gift to The Urban Alternative. Billy Graham was speeding, true story. Billy Graham was speeding, he got pulled over. And he had to pay the fine. He went to court to pay the fine just 10 miles over the speed limit. He went in there, and the judge says, well, how do you plead? He says, I'm, I'm guilty. I'm guilty. The judge didn't recognize him at first. Then the judge caught when he heard the voice who he's talking to, Billy Graham. He said, um, you, you pleading guilty? He says, yeah, yeah I, was, I was guilty. He says, but Dr. Graham, this is, this is going to cost you $100. He says, I know, I, I was guilty. But this guy just couldn't get over. He's sitting in front of Billy Graham, the greatest evangelist in all of human history, and he's going to fine him $100 for going 10 miles an hour over the speed limit. The judge reached in his pocket. pulled out a $100 bill, put it down and said, fine, paid. And then he looked at Dr. Graham and said, can I take you out for steak dinner? (laughs) Got his fine paid and got a steak dinner. (laughs) Having broken the law, judge who never took me out for no steak dinner. (laughs) How did Dr. Graham get that? Because of who he was. You see, you got to know who you are. (laughs) You you have to understand who you are. Your father loves you. And yes, there are times where he tickets you, but only because he wants to show you grace. Grace. When God lets you see grace, what you don't deserve, he says, the thorns that are sticking you, that you fussing about, got an attitude about, now begin to work for you. We've all been to the doctor. We've all been stuck by a needle. That pricks, irritates, frustrates, hate needles. But inside the prick is medicine. The same thing hurting you is helping you. And if you say, don't stick me because the needle hurts, 
Well, you may be out of the pain, but you're also out of the medication. If God is sticking you and you prayed about it, and that nothing is more irritating than having heard a sermon about trust God, pray to God, you pray to God, and he does nothing, you need to know that nothing had medicine in it. That leaving the thorn was like a person on an IV with the needle stuck in, drip, 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 he's doing something. But if you keep pulling out the IV because you don't like the thorn, you'll never see the medication at work. He says, and when you see grace, my grace, not people's grace, my grace, which came when he prayed, my power, is perfected in weakness. Thorns make you weak, don't they? God says, I'm going to give you grace. And then in your weakness, what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you my power. Why? Because God loves weak things so that when it becomes strong, there is no question how it got there. There is no question who the glory goes to, who the credit goes to. So the thorns begin to work for you. That's why God used a little boy like David to kill a Goliath. That's why he told Gideon to make his army smaller because it was through the weak things, things that are broken, stripped, bared down. God loves to use broken things. He breaks the seed to get a plant. He breaks a cloud to get rain. And he breaks people to show them his power. He makes the thorn reduce you to a level of absolute dependency on him. Okay, so let's close. What do you do? I got a thorn. It won't go away. I've been trying to run from the thorn, pull the thorn out myself. It just keep coming back. And so, and I haven't seen any grace. I don't have any power. Tell me what to do. All right, let's let Paul tell you what to do. Verse 9, most gladly, therefore, I will rather boast about my weakness that the power of Christ may dwell in me. Therefore, I am well content with weaknesses. And then he says at the end of verse 10, for when I am weak, I am strong. Guess what he said I'm going to do? Brag about my thorn. Did you see that? Boast about my weakness, brag about my thorn. Paul said, I got this thing sticking me. (laughs) Boy, isn't it great? (laughs) This thing is driving me crazy. Praise the Lord. Wait a minute, wait a minute, don't look at me. Isn't that what he said? He said, I'm going to boast about my weakness. I'm going to thank God for that insensitive husband. I'm going to bless God that He hadn't brought me a man or a woman for a mate yet. I'm a brag that that I'm frustrated uh, uh, by these circumstances. I'm going to brag and I'm going to praise him. And the reason that I am going to praise him is because when I am weak, when I can't see my way out, when I don't know which way to go, he going to show up and I'm going to see his strength. You say, well, why haven't I seen it yet? Because you haven't been boasting yet. You've been complaining, grumbling, fussing, cussing. You haven't been praising, blessing, bragging, and boasting. You haven't approached the thorn right yet. All you keep saying is, it's not there. Why me? Why now? I'm tired. I don't believe that God answers prayer. That's not how you handle a thorn. He says, you boast in it and chill with it. I will be content with it. You chill. You stay right where you are and you chill with it. There's this office building that didn't build enough elevators. They didn't make enough elevators for the building. And so people had to wait a long time to wait for the elevators. You've been in a building like that. Don't seem to have enough elevators for the size of the building. So they had to decide what to do about this building, what to do about this building because it was too expensive 
to put another shaft in and put another elevator in. It would cost too much money, but they couldn't have their people waiting like that, being discontent. And they came up with a novel idea. On every floor, they put mirrors. Every single floor, mirrors all around where the elevators were. So folks spent time looking at themselves. <laughs> go around looking at And they discovered if they could focus on something else, somebody not praying with me, if, if they could focus on something else, it'll make the wait for the elevator not seem as long. Some of you are tired of waiting, but you're focusing on the wrong thing. God says, boast about your weakness. Focus on me while you wait for God to bring the elevator to deliver you from the floor he got you stuck on. You've got to shift your focus while you wait for your change. Dr. Tony Evans with advice on understanding the purpose behind the pain we sometimes experience. Part of his current series called Freedom Through Forgiveness. As I mentioned earlier, it's yours with our thanks when you make a donation toward Tony's ministry, along with a copy of his companion booklet for this series, 30 Days to Victory Through Forgiveness. So visit us today at TonyEvans.org to get all the details before time runs out. You can make your contribution and your request online Again, that's TonyEvans.org. Or call our 24-hour Resource Center at 1-800-800-3222 and let one of our team members help you. That's 1-800-800-3222. Well, tomorrow, Dr. Evans has some good news for believers being held hostage by their past as he talks about the important relationship between the pardon we need and the pardon we give. Right now, though, he's back with a special invitation for you. If you're not absolutely sure that you have received salvation, that you're on your way to heaven, then let's get that straight right now. God offers you salvation as a free gift because of the sacrifice of his son. And if you will come to Jesus Christ, acknowledging your need for a savior because you recognize you're a sinner, recognizing you can't save yourself, and appealing to Jesus to apply his death into your life, He will come in, forgive your sins, and give you eternal life right now. Simply say to the Lord, I know I'm a sinner. I know I need a Savior. I'm believing in you alone to be my Savior. So I now accept your offer to give me eternal life and the forgiveness of sins. And then thank him for the free salvation he just gave you. The Alternative with Dr. Tony Evans is brought to you by The Urban Alternative and is celebrating 40 years of faithfulness thanks to the generous contributions of listeners like you. of grace. Dr. Tony Evans says the secret of becoming godly is found in what Jesus Christ offers. He is the master key that opens up the lock to godliness. Celebrating 40 years of faithfulness, this is The Alternative with Dr. Tony Evans, author, speaker, senior pastor of Oak Cliff Bible Fellowship in Dallas, Texas, and president of The Urban Alternative. There are some great foods out there that simply can't be made when the recipe omits a key ingredient. Likewise, godliness will never be realized in our lives if we leave out the essential component. Today, Dr. Evans explores just what that special ingredient is as he unveils the mystery of godliness. Let's join him. Paul tells Timothy, the pastor of Ephesus Bible Fellowship, that I want you to teach the congregation how men ought to conduct themselves how men ought to live their lives, who are part of the household of God, part of the family of God. And I want you to do that, but I want you to explain to them the mystery of godliness. 
He says, this mystery is by common confession, meaning everybody ought to agree with it. Common confession means everybody's saying the same thing. Everybody understanding it the same way. It's common to everybody. So I want to explain to this fellowship the mystery. Whatever this mystery is, it's a beast. Because he says great is the mystery. He says there is a mystery about godliness that was unclear in the Old Testament that now has been made clear in the New Testament. Hebrews chapter 8, we're coming right back here to 1 Timothy, but Hebrews chapter 8 is one place that summarizes this. In verse 6 of Hebrews 8, it says, but now he has obtained a more excellent ministry. But as much as he is also the mediator of a better covenant, which has been enacted on better promises, verse 10, for this is the covenant I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my law into their minds. I will write them on their hearts. I will be their God. They will be my people. They shall not teach everyone his fellow citizens and everyone his brother saying, know the Lord for all will know me from the least of the to the greatest of them for I will be merciful to their iniquities. I will remember their sins no more. When he said a new covenant, New Testament, he has made the first obsolete Old Testament but whatever is becoming obsolete, is growing old, is ready to disappear. So, God says, I'm making a new arrangement, covenant, testament, that will make obsolete the old testament, covenant, and the new testament, covenant, is better than the old testament, covenant. Which means... If you're living in the Old Testament, you're missing the New Testament. If you're living in the Old Testament, you're living under something that has been made obsolete. I'll explain what that means in a moment. Because of something better that has come along. The mystery between the two covenants, Old Testament, New Testament, is a mystery related to how you become godly. It's the mystery of godliness. It's the mysterious understanding of how we consistently are to reflect the character of God in our lives. In the Old Covenant Testament, you were told what you must do and you were told it negatively. Let's take the Ten Commandments, which is a summary of the Old Covenant. Thou shalt not, 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 thou shalt not. So you were told in a negative way what you ought not do in the Old Covenant. But in Hebrews 8, the scripture we just read, we went from you must and you shouldn't to I will. He says in the New Covenant, I will, I will, I will, I will, I will, I will, I will. In the Old Covenant, you better not, you better not, you better not, you better not, you better not. He says that the new covenant, which is a mystery because it wasn't revealed fully in the Old Testament, is better. Many years ago, before the advancement of technology, your grandparents or great-grandparents cleaned their clothes with a scrubbing board. They got the scrubbing board out, they got the pail of water, and they would scrub and scrub and scrub to make dirty clothes clean and every week or how often they did it they would have to roll up their sleeves because they were trying to make something dirty clean for their children themselves or their mate to wear and the way they did it was by scrubbing the mess out then along came washing machines the goal of the washing machine was the very same goal of the scrubbing board but the power to pull off is different. The scrubbing board that grandmother used to use depended on elbow grease and her ability to go up and down, up and down, wring it out, twist it, then can another piece go up and down, up and down. The power to get it clean depended on her. But in the new covenant called the washing machine, 
versus the old covenant called the scrubbing board, while the purpose was the same, the power was different. Because the power to get it clean was residing in the machine, not in the elbow grease of grandma. The old covenant is elbow grease. It's, I'm going to make myself better. I'm going to stop doing this. I'm going to try to do better. I promise. I rededicate. Then I rededicate my rededication that I rededicated the last time I rededicated. And so I'm scrubbing and I'm scrubbing and I'm trying and I'm trying and I'm getting tired because every week I got to clean this thing up again. That's the old covenant. The new covenant is the washing machine, which means that the power in the new covenant, the washing machine, is greater than the power in the old covenant, my elbows. Because the washing machine, new covenant, was built in such a way that it has more power to clean things than my effort can ever do on my own. I dare say, once grandma got a washing machine, she discarded her scrubbing board. Because to go back to the scrubbing board was now to go back to something obsolete. It was to go back to something that would not produce what this new thing, this new invention. If cleanliness is used for godliness under the new covenant, which is better than the old covenant, it's what God will do, not what you do. One of the problems is Christians who dance between covenants. They use the washing machine this week and the board that week. The washing machine this week and the board that week. And they wonder why some weeks I'm really clean, godly, and other weeks I'm not so clean, godly, because you're shifting covenants. He said, once you have a washing machine, you do not go back to the board. You don't go back there because to go back there is to retreat to something inferior. And that's why it's a mystery because it was not clear like this in the Old Testament. Let's go a little further. He says under this mystery that's awesome, he calls it great. And it has to do with being godly. That is, lifestyles consistent with the manifestation character of God, he says, has to do with a person. Please notice. He says in 1 Timothy 3 verse 16, he was revealed in the flesh, was vindicated in the spirit, seen by angels, proclaimed among nations, believed on in the world, taken up the glory. So he speaks about Jesus Christ. He never wrote a song, but there are more songs written about him than any other human being that's ever lived. He never wrote a book, yet his book has sold more than every other book, and there have been more books written about him than any other person who has ever lived. He is proclaimed worldwide, believed on in the world, and that's why on Sunday in churches all around the world, they are there to give recognition to Jesus Christ because of his uniqueness, taking up the glory that is having raised from the dead, ascended up to heaven, seated on the right hand of the Father in a position of exaltation. This is the mysterious one. The mystery of becoming godly is centered on the uniqueness of Jesus Christ. He is, if you will, the master key that opens up the lock to godliness, to being godly. Stick with me now. Godliness is not tied merely to your belief in God. Godliness is tied to the mysterious one or the uniqueness of Jesus Christ. He is the centerpiece of understanding what it means to be godly and the enablement to use the washing machine and no longer the scrubbing board. Now, everyone here who's a Christian who's received Jesus Christ as their sin bearer should want to become godly. The one thing God has put in you is the desire to be godly, which means that you hate the point that you are not godly. In other words, if you love being ungodly, then you need to raise a whole nother question. And that is whether Christ is living in you. Because the one thing that comes with salvation is a desire 
to be godly even if you are ungodly. I may have the addiction, but I hate that I have it and I want to get rid of it even if I fail to get rid of it thus far. Because there is this desire to be godly. Dr. Evans will come back in a moment to share the mystery ingredient in godliness. Don't go away. Even though we'd love for life to be pleasant and happy all the time, that's just not how life works. We will have difficult seasons of life, winter seasons. As Crystal Hurst and Priscilla Shire explore in the new Lois Evans Legacy Bible Study, Seasons of a Woman's Life. The winter season is also an opportunity for you to be driven into the safe place Mm -hmm. and for you to find that you can, even in that difficult season, take refuge in Him. Get your copy of this powerful book, workbook, and DVD series now with your generous gift to The Urban Alternative. Find out more about Seasons of a Woman's Life when you visit us at TonyEvans.org. And while you're there, be sure to check out Tony's popular book, God Himself. It's a probing look at the many characteristics that make the Lord who He is, His nature, His goodness, His love, and much more. We serve an infinite God, so there's always more to learn. But Tony says the deeper our understanding, the richer our worship. And since we're made in God's image, knowing who He is defines who we are. We'd like to send you a copy of this book as our thank you gift when you make a contribution to help us keep Tony's teaching on this station. Along with it, we'll include all four full-length messages in Tony's current teaching series, In Pursuit of Godliness. It's a deep dive into the meaning and mystery of godliness, and will give you the motivation and means of living a more excellent life. Get all the details at TonyEvans.org or call our 24-hour resource request line at 1-800-800-3222. That's 1-800-800-3222. Right now, let's join Dr. Evans for part two of today's lesson. The mystery of godliness is tied now to the person of Jesus Christ. Now, how is it tied? Titus chapter 2, verses 11 and following. For the grace of God, verse 11, has appeared bringing salvation to all men instructing us to deny ungodliness, there's our word, and worldly desires and to live sensibly, righteously, and godly, there's our word again, in this present age. He says the grace of God has appeared. It appeared when Jesus appeared. In John 1 it says, the law came by Moses, but grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. So with the appearance of Jesus came the appearance of grace. It's not that grace didn't exist in the Old Testament. It's that when the New Testament opens up and Jesus is introduced on the scene, the grace of God has now appeared to all men. And now it is universal in its expression. Many people don't know it, but they go back to the old covenant every time they go back to self-help. Every time they go to, I promise I'm not going to do it anymore. That's old covenant talk. That's old covenant thought because it depends on you. He says the grace of God has appeared. Romans 6.14 says you are no longer under the Mosaic law. You are now under grace. And it has appeared in a person. Jesus Christ. He says, where you get the power to say no to sin and yes to right is by the instruction of grace. 2 Corinthians 5.21 says, he who knew no sin became sin for us, bore our sins on the cross, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. Let me say it another way. On the cross, Jesus died on credit. Jesus never sinned. He was a perfect being. So what God did is he took all the sins of the world, bundled them together, and put them on Jesus. So Jesus was credited with our sin. That's what took him to the cross, and that's what killed him. He didn't die because of his sin. He died because our sin was credited to his account. So he had to pay the bill. When he paid the bill, his last word was testelestai, which means it is finished, paid in full. Everybody, watch this, who accepts Jesus, the righteousness of Christ was credited to his account. Well, how much righteousness is that? 
That's righteousness that fulfilled all the requirements of the Old Testament. So the law that condemns you and me has already been fulfilled in Jesus. But when you accepted Jesus, God credited the righteousness of Christ onto your account. So you not only go to heaven on credit, but the righteousness that God expects you to live as a godly Christian, you also have credited to you. In other words, the righteousness you're looking for, you already have. Most Christians who are serious Christians, we're not failing because we don't know what's right. We're failing with powerlessness to pull it off. Which means one thing. Watch this. That Christ in us has not been expanded. Okay, wait, watch this. When a woman gets pregnant... She has the life within her, but in order for that life to be revealed, that life must grow inside of her. And you know when that life is growing because the belly is getting bigger. The, the life inside that was only a little teeny seed once it got fertilized now begins to expand and take over room inside of her belly. You can accept Jesus as Savior, but if there is no expansion of Christ inside of us, Christ in us, the scripture says, which is the hope of glory. If there is no expansion of the life, that's why you will discover how to expand the life within so that you're living more godly without. Because just hearing more sermons on you shouldn't do this, you shouldn't do that, you shouldn't do this, you shouldn't do that. The Old Testament was, was you got to do, you got to do, you got to do, you got to do, you got to do. The new covenant was done, 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 and done. It's taking something already done and magnifying it, not whipping yourself up. That's why, that's why when you, we hear a sermon, you get all whipped up. Okay, I'm ready to live for God now. I'm ready to serve God now. I'm ready to get rid of this addiction now. I promise I'm not going to do that anymore now. And you get whipped up in the flesh. You get whipped up because you get all excited. And less than 24 hours later, <laughs> die down. Because you were influenced from the outside without any change on the inside. If the baby's not growing inside, it doesn't matter how whipped up you get on the outside. And that's why you can go to church and not change. Jesus Christ brought grace out of the shadows and into the public square for the purpose of transforming us. The only thing I wanted you to understand now was the mystery. The mystery is Christ in you. God revealed in the flesh inside of you and the job of the Holy Spirit is to make the indwelling Christ expand within you so that you are naturally becoming more godly. You're not scrubbing it. You're putting it in the washing machine and getting cleansed by it. God wants to reveal his mystery within each of us, but there's a requirement on our part. It begins with acknowledging and receiving it. Dr. Tony Evans is here with a word about how to start. If you've been listening to the broadcast and you have yet to accept Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, we can resolve that right now. I'm going to say a little prayer. I want you to pray it after me, but you've got to mean it for yourself. Lord Jesus, I'm a sinner, and I know I need a Savior because I can't save myself. So right now, I trust you alone because you died for me and arose for me to be my sin bearer. You are now my substitute and I'm believing you to forgive my sin and to give me eternal life. Thank you for the free gift of salvation that you have given to me. Help me to live a life to please you. In Jesus' name, amen. Welcome to the family, and we'll keep ministering to you for your spiritual growth through our broadcast. God bless you. If you prayed that prayer right now, let me encourage you to visit TonyEvans.org and follow the link that says Jesus. There you can download some free follow-up resources that will help you get your brand new life started right. Well, today's lesson was the second in Tony's current series, In Pursuit of Godliness. 
Don't forget, all four full-length messages in this collection can be yours with our thanks if you'll help us keep bringing you Tony's teaching each day with your generous contribution. You'll receive the complete series on CD and downloadable MP3s, and as a special bonus, you'll also receive Tony's popular book, God Himself, A Journey Through His Attributes. To take advantage of this limited-time offer, be sure to call for details, 1-800-800-3222. Resource team members are on hand 24-7 to help you. That's 1-800-800-3222. Or make the arrangements and get your digital downloads right away at TonyEvans.org. Again, that's TonyEvans.org. Having a lifestyle that's consistent with the character of God sounds like a great idea, but it may be easier said than done. On Monday, Dr. Evans will tell us how we can turn godliness from an abstract theory into an absolute reality. Right now, though, he's back with this thought-provoking story. There was a man one day, a father who loved his son. His son died. The father had drawn up a will. And so when the father died, the lawyer came, read the will that all of his expensive things are to be auctioned. So he came and the auctioneer said, the first piece that we're going to bring out is a picture of the man's son. He says, do I have a bid? Well, nobody bid it because they didn't come for that. They didn't come for an old picture of the boy. They came for some expensive art pieces and and, and all these artifacts and stuff. So nobody was bidding. Out of the shadows from the back of the room came an old man. And the old man said, sir, I was the servant of of the man who died. And if nobody will take the picture of the boy, I want to know if I can have it. The auctioneer said, one more time, is there anyone who will bid on the picture of the son? Nobody bid it. He said, sir, you may have the picture to the servant. Then he picked up the gavel, hit the gavel down, and said, the auction is over. Everybody's looking around, saying, what? You haven't brought out any of the expensive pieces that are supposed to be auctioned out? How can the auction be over? He said, let me read the will. The will said, you are to auction off all of my expensive properties, starting with a picture of my son. And whoever gets the picture of my son gets everything else in my estate. Because I value my son so highly that he that hath the son 